Welcome to the 21st Century Business Forum. I'm your host, John Gordon, and today our guest is Steve Cannon. Steve is the former CEO and president of Mercedes and the current CEO of the AMB Group. Steve shares a lot of wisdom and insights on leadership, culture, and building great teams. Steve, thanks for joining us today. Hey, John. Great to talk to you. Appreciate the time. Steve, it's great to have you. Steve, you had an amazing experience at the West Point Academy. You're a graduate of there. How did that experience prepare you for the amazing leader that you are today? I had an amazing experience at West Point. Um, at the end, it's a leadership academy. Its sole purpose is to educate and grow leaders that would uh, that would lead our forces in the military. And, um, and so all the lessons that they taught have kind of informed who I am as a leader. And now 35 years later, since I graduated, kind of everything that I learned there, I still try to put into practice every single day. You know, and first and foremost, it's about people. Leadership is a people business. And unless you care deeply, deeply about people, you're not gonna be a good leader. So as, as officers, we learned that, you know, officers eat last and the care and welfare of your, of your soldiers is the most important, even sacred responsibility. That got driven into me kind of from day one at West Point. And, and I followed that you know, ever since I left after five years. Uh, but those lessons I, I, I try to put into practice every single day. You're the former president and CEO of Mercedes and the current CEO of the AMB Group. Can you talk about leading these two organizations and some of the things you took with you from West Point that you put into practice as the leader of these amazing organizations? Right. So uh, two completely different businesses, right? Uh, CEO for Mercedes-Benz USA. So I'd been in the car business my whole life, but it, but there it was about creating a phenomenal experience for people that, that plunk $100,000 down uh, for an amazing Mercedes-Benz. And then I pivoted over into the sports business where it's, a, it's about bringing people together. It's about creating a phenomenal fan experience. So moving from customer experience to fan experience, that felt very familiar to me. You know, but at the end, it, it's really about creating a vision. What, what leaders do is they've got to create a compelling vision that can rally the entire organization. And for me at Mercedes-Benz, our vision was to create the most phenomenal customer experience in the business, to, to benchmark against the, the best out there, whether the best is the Ritz-Carlton or name the best customer service brand. That was our vision there. And then I carried that a very similar vision uh, into the sports business when we opened our stadium we said, we're a stadium that aspires to be a Ritz-Carlton. We're not in the sports business. We're in the hospitality business. So the degree to which we can create phenomenal experiences for our guests to welcome this, them with eye contact and with smiles and create that overall experience, I can't affect whether the, the team wins or loses, but I can affect the experience that people get every time they come in contact with us. So for me, it's about creating that compelling vision. And whether it's with cars or it's with sports, um, that's kind of what we had in common. When you first take over an organization, what do you do as a leader to make sure that you start to connect with the people, the vision, and the purpose? So for me, um, in joining organizations, one of my most, uh, one of my leadership beliefs is that you listen more than you speak. And I have I have run into so many leaders who come into organizations and think it's their job to demonstrate how smart they are to everybody else. So they, they're constantly demonstrating you know, their, their intellect and their intelligence. And, and, and for me, wherever I go, I close my mouth and I open my ears and I ask lots and lots and lots of questions. And, and, and by doing that, I start to extract the intelligence out of the organization. I start to learn who really knows what they're talking about. So I've found in my, in my career, the best way um, is to enter an organization kind of, kind of quietly, listen more than you speak. And, and, and I learned that in the military uh, because as a brand new lieutenant about to take over a platoon or a company with soldiers out there that have been there for 20 years and, and, and have forgotten more than you know, if you come in with your mouth open too much, um, you're going to have a harsh awakening. So that lesson has served me well in both the military and out, and in the civilian world. That goes to the heart of macro leadership and micro leadership. At West Point, you learn macro strategy. And from what I understand, the minute you go out to your platoon, you now have to demonstrate micro leadership. You have to lead these people. You have to coach these people. 
And it's a lot more difficult to, to do the micro part, the coaching part. Did you have to learn that early on as a leader? Well, it, you know, to me, one of the best kind of metaphors or examples of leadership are coaches. So right now, right now I'm in the sports business. I get to see world-class coaches uh, who are on the field of play every single day. They observe their players. They make micro corrections. They understand that someday I might need a pat on the back and a sensitive ear. Another day it might require a kick in the butt to help motivate. But great leaders are number one, are present. They're there on the field. They're not sitting in a corner office trying to absorb data through spreadsheets. They're absorbing data through observation, through contact. Uh, and, and I find that model of leadership coaching is to me very, very powerful. So wherever I go and, and, and um, in that leadership role is how do you stay as connected to your people as possible? Anything that gets in the way of you and your organization and your people, and whether that's a busy schedule or it's a corner office or it's perks that tend to put you in a private room for, for lunch versus somewhere, something else, any one of those things uh, that, that puts space between you and the people that you lead, I avoid them like the plague because proximity to the people and to their experience is absolutely essential if you're going to try to get the most out of that team to motivate them to the highest degree they can and to give them the feedback, the coaching and the development they need to be their best selves. And that's what good leaders do all the time. How important is culture? And as a leader, what is your role in creating the culture? So one of my favorite sayings is from a management guru named Peter Drucker. You've probably heard it, John. A culture eats strategy for breakfast. I heard that years and years ago, and I've, I've absorbed that into my DNA. Um, and it's one of my most powerful and strongly held leadership beliefs. Because at the end of the day, a leader's job is to create culture. The leader is involved, it creates the environment that where people can understand the purpose, can, under, can, can, uh, can receive the kind of coaching, receive the kind of development, they get the tools that they need to show up every day. All of that comes from great leaders. So for me, the best metaphor, the metaphor I like to use when describing culture is, um, you know, look at the iPhone, right? The iPhone is this magical device that no one can live without. It's always in our pocket, it's always in our hands. Well. The operating system is the thing that brings it all together. Without the operating system, all it is is a bunch of Gorilla Glass, some plastic, and some processing power. But when you put that operating system on top of that, it pulls it all together, and it makes this magical, intuitive device that no one can live without. So for me, culture is, that, is the operating system that governs an organization, and that allows leaders to know that if I invest time and energy into the curation of an amazing culture, then the likelihood that great decisions will be made, whether I'm in the room or not in the room, that goes up dramatically. So if I have, a, if I have an hour available, only an hour available in my day as a leader, and I have the choice to invest that in strategy development or culture development, every single time I'm going to choose culture development, knowing that, hey, it's not an either or proposition. It just demonstrates that it starts with culture. And if you spend more of your time investing in that, good outcomes will follow. Your culture will make sure your strategy is successful. And you had a stadium this past year, a beautiful state-of-the-art stadium, incredible facility, incredible place. And yet it was empty most of the year based on, on COVID. As a leader, how did you navigate that challenge with your team and how did you stay positive throughout that process? That, um, COVID demonstrated, you know, crisis moments, difficult moments really demonstrate how important leadership is. So if you think about it, our business got essentially shut down. And then we took all of our, our, our associates, our employees, we sent them home. Some of them moved out of state back, to, back with mom and dad. Some of them were working, you know, with kids and dogs and distractions all day long. So this was a really difficult circumstance, not to mention the fact that the media, you know, with, with all the drama and and the infection rates, it was scary stuff. And so, uh, so that was a challenging moment. And we stepped up by saying, in this moment where we are all separated, we are gonna over communicate. So we, we established a, a weekly digital town hall, got all 500 people from our organization. Every single Friday, we came together via Zoom and, and uh, 
gave them updates on the business, updates on how we're going to operate, what got canceled, what didn't got get canceled. So I just share with those as, as an example of just one of the things that we did where we had to pivot and say, look, we can't come together, but we can still stay present and we can still continue to conduct our business. Um, and, and I guess the lesson is, um, as leaders, agility is everything. You never know what's around the corner as a leader, but if you create a high trust, dynamic, agile organization that is that communicates really well and all of a sudden you get slammed with something you never expected and and certainly covid was was a, a 100 year event you're able to adapt and and pivot accordingly and still continue to add value to accomplish the mission and that's what good agile leadership does what did you learn about yourself as a leader during this time and how did you grow during this time um I was challenged like I've never been challenged as, as, as a leader. And I, I think one of the most important things, um, my takeaways and my learning is you got to be present, <laughs> being present for people, especially in difficult, troubling times is the most important thing that a, that a leader can provide. And if you think about how we behave as people in society, we are running around um, we're all over-programmed, we're all too busy, we're all checking our emails probably a thousand times more than, 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 than it needs to be checked. We all think that that text needs to be responded to in a nanosecond. And, and I've actually seen leaders in meetings with their people stop their meeting and check their, check their iPhone and go, go check their email. Think about the message that you're sending when you do something like that. You're saying what's going on here in this little device is more important than the engagement that we have in this moment right now. So for me, you know, the, the learning is um, being present is a very, very, very powerful thing. And whether that's being present for your kids or for your for your spouse or for your associates, um, that has an enormous impact on human relations. And at the end, leadership is all about managing human relations. I've had a lot of organizations say they adapted, they innovated during this time and they actually grew stronger. So now they're gonna be stronger going forward. How are you and your team going forward stronger based on what you've been through? So I, you know, over the past 10 months, I've been preaching, there's really three kinds of companies, three kinds of organizations. There are those companies that are gonna, they're, they're gonna go away because of this pandemic. And we've seen that happen. The category two is the kind of company that are gonna hold on for dear life and make it through and hope for a better day, but won't be better off on the other side. And then there are the other companies that lean into this moment that, that, that communicate, that adapt and that innovate. And they're gonna come through this challenge um, through this kind of crucible of fire, and they're going to be stronger and better. So I've been preaching for the last 10 months, we're going to be that third type of company, and we're going to do it uh, by, by innovating. And so some of the things that we have to do when we shut our stadium is how do we create an environment uh, in COVID where mass gathering is the enemy, right? I mean, think about it, super spreader events. How many times have you heard that spoken about in the media? So we had to, we had to um, really lean into the moment and Gosh, we did some pretty cool things from uh, cash. So we went completely cashless the year before. So no touch, no queuing. Uh, we, we established for our concession model, uh, kind of order go. So you can pull up your iPhone, uh, order everything, and then just scan your barcode to pick it up when you get to the, to the concession stand. All of that was designed to get people out of queues and spending more time in their safer seats um, versus you know, milling about in, in concourses. Uh, in our in our golf business, we we stood up a, a curbside caddy system where essentially you could configure your order uh, online and then drive up to one of our PGA Tour superstores and then an associate would bring it back, bring it out, put it in your in your trunk without any contact. So all of those challenges, we had to stand those business processes up in the middle of a pandemic. So we were all forced to innovate. I think that was one of the the biggest takeaways, like even in a pandemic, even when you're separated, you can innovate and you can get better. As the former CEO of Mercedes, and then now the CEO of AMB Group, you know about customer service, you know about providing amazing experiences. So as a leader, how do you lead an organization to get them to provide those experiences? Because it's different than just leading a group versus leading customer service, leading hospitality. How do you lead in, in that way? 
So, so it, it has to be your top priority. Everything starts with leaders. You can talk about uh, wanting to be number one in customer experience or number one in fan experience, but if if what you do uh, every single day doesn't connect with that, then all it is is an empty platitude that hangs on a wall. So some of the things that I do is, you know, we have 4,000 game day associates that are ambassadors, and uh, they're the ones that ultimately deliver the, that amazing fan experience. The way I like to talk to them about it is every single game, there are 10,000 moments of truth. And are you going to stand up to that moment of truth? Or are you going to put your head you know, down looking at your iPhone? So you're responsible for that. And, the, and for, for me to create a culture where people are celebrated for that is ultimately what delivers that. So before every single game, at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. I get there several hours early. I attend the huddles, which are essentially the, the guest hospitality teams coming together. I high five them, I hug them, or I used to hug them before, before COVID. Now we fist bump or we elbow bump, John. But uh, essentially we celebrate them. And, and, and as long as they believe that they've got the backing um, and, and the air cover from, from me and from our leadership, they know that when that moment of truth comes their way, they're going to step up and, and do the right thing. So it's really about kind of putting it all into action as opposed to talking about it. And I think that's probably the most important contribution that I get to make because the minute people believe if I do this thing, um, even if I take a risk, uh, you know, I'm going to be okay. Uh, then, then they start doing exceptional things. And if you can get more people doing exceptional things at scale, suddenly you've done something phenomenal. And that's what we're trying to do. I love the way you model care by actually caring about your team and being involved and showing them that you're there with them. That must mean so much to them and they see it, they feel it. How important is it to care as a leader? Uh -huh. Uh, I, it, it's worth everything. So one, one of the ways that we celebrate our game day associates, is we created this, this giant uh, mural and it's called heroes of hospitality. And it's right there in a public facing uh, uh, on the, on the very first concourse where then the, the names and the faces of those that have delivered exceptional hospitality are celebrated. But we went a step further. Uh, we have a, we have these little induction ceremonies on a monthly basis, and before a game, we invite those that are going to get their names hung up on a wall, and we throw a little breakfast for them, and we celebrate them. Well, tears flow every single time. Then we did this. We went a little step further. Is we said, for your induction ceremony, we want you to invite your family, and we had our associates bring their families and the pride that that they that they exuded when they had their family there and I got up and, and thanked them and talked about what they had done. Um, if you, you know, that is like rocket fuel and, and the word of, of, of their being, them being celebrated just cascades across our organization. And, and at the end, you've got to create a movement and, and you won't create a movement unless people believe in its little moments and little ceremonies and little rituals like walking around and high-fiving where people start to believe. And then you can turn something from one incident of great care into a movement where it happens all across the stadium all, all the time. And that's what, that's what we're trying to do. I just had the visual of that. It is so powerful. I often say that leadership is a transfer of belief. As a leader, how do you transfer your belief to the people that report to you and also to the entire organization. Yeah, um, leadership is a contact sport. It's the way I like to call it. You can't transfer belief from a distance. You can't transfer belief from, a, from the corner office. You've got to get out. You've got to move around. You've got to mix it up. You've got to be present. So I make sure that I schedule time to walk around. And whether that's walking around my ritual pregame where I'm celebrating game day associates or whether, whether that's in our office environment where I'm moving around, just coming up to somebody, asking them how they're doing. It's so, for, for me, the transfer of belief is, can only be done through proximity, through contact, through constant example, role modeling. And, and, and once again, over time, that starts to absorb itself into an organization and that that belief system, as that increases, you know, great, great things happen. That is so good. Right now, a lot of people are struggling. Businesses are struggling. What advice do you have for businesses and leaders to be able to move through this time to grow and, and get better and come out of this, you know, okay. Yeah, it's just, it's, it starts with 
the, just the care for your people. What, what, um, what COVID showed us is that if you're not paying attention to your people, you've got a problem. All of a sudden, we're not together every single day in an office environment. And, and I've got people and I'm looking into your life through, through a Zoom lens. And I'm watching kids sort of pop in and out of the, uh, of the screen. And I'm looking at the struggles that they have trying to balance you know, this unnatural kids working from home and all of a sudden the pets in the screen, like you're, you're looking into their lives. And what came, what, what made itself very clear is at the end, we, we don't just lead people that their work lives. We're, you're one person, right? And we, you bring your whole self to work every single day. And, and I think the pandemic gave us a, a, a lens into the whole person, into their lives, into their struggles, into their challenges during a very, very difficult environment. So at the end, uh, you know, my advice is, is lead the whole person, care about them, not just for the eight hours that they're with you, um, you know, in the office environment, care about the entire person, demonstrate that you care. How is it going at home? What are your struggles? I think those are the, that's that extra level of caring that once people know about that, they're, they make themselves available to you in a different way. You went to West Point, you know about teamwork, you've led teams, and now you're part of a sports organization that competes as a team. How important is teamwork and how do you build a great team? What, what is the process look like when you take over to foster teamwork? For me, teamwork starts with trust. And I've watched, I've, I've worked inside of high trust organizations and I've worked inside of low trust organizations um, and, and, and low trust teams. And inside of low trust teams, you know, I'm doing my job, but he's not doing his job. And there's just all kinds of misfires that take place. And kind of my metaphor, because, you know, because I was in the car business is, you know, trust is like engine lubricant that, you know, when you take the lubricant out of an engine, you know, the cogs and the, and the mechanical parts start to rub against each other and, and energy is lost to friction. It's wasted. High trust teams have that level of lubricant, that benefit of the doubt that allows things to work in a frictionless way so that all the energy of that engine, all the energy of that organization is going to output and not being lost to friction. So for me, inside of teams, you have to establish trust and just understand that it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Tr trust doesn't just magically descend on an organization. You have to do things. You have to invest time and energy to create a level of trust inside of an organization so that, so that you can function like that high-performing engine with that lubricant so that everything is moving in the same direction towards that output, torque in the engine's case, or results in a, you know, in a business unit. One of the biggest mistakes that leaders make is they don't address the negativity that starts to rise up on their team or happen within their team and organization. How do you as a leader address the negativity? How do you deal with it and make sure it doesn't sabotage your team and organization along the way? As a leader, uh, you got to have a lot of listening posts. Uh, you know, I, I establish listening posts inside of organizations where I can hear things. And, and as long as I've got those the likelihood of me hearing about either resentments being built up or negativity starting to, you know, increase inside of an organization, I can proactively begin proactively begin to address them. So it's really important to have listening posts. So for me, um, I, I I spend a lot of time doing what I call CEO skip level lunches. So I grab you know randomly selected ten group you know group of ten people from different disciplines, and on a very regular basis. We sit together and I just say, all right, this is your time. Tell me what's going on. What do you, what, what, what's good about the organization? What's not, what's not great? How can I be better? What resources are missing? So that's a, that's a listening forum. There are other more formal listening mechanisms and that like a, a, a a culture survey is something that we deploy every single year. That's an anonymous survey where you get to tell me what we're doing well and what we're not doing well. And every single year, I look at that data with my senior leaders. We workshop what the culture survey tells us. We, we pick the biggest challenges, and then we get back to our associates and say, this is what you've told us. You've said, we're not doing so great here, here, and here. And this is what we're going to do to address that. So, um, establishing listening posts is really important, 
But if you only listen and you don't respond, you know, at some point people are going to stop telling you the truth because it, because I, I haven't seen actions that have come out of um, out of those listening sessions. So listening matters, responding even more important. But you got to do both. It's one of the best things I've ever heard. I love that. In terms of the future, people are talking about the new normal or what normal is going to look like. What do you believe normal will look like? And we're not going to hold you to this, but what are you forecasting? What are you seeing as a leader? What does it look like for stadiums, for sporting events? What can we hope for as we move forward? Yeah. Look, um, the, key, the key message is there ain't no new normal. The world is changing so fast uh, with whether it's processing power or intelligence, they've decoded the human genome and the, the innovations that we're going to see in our lifetime are, are staggering, staggering. And they're going to, they're going to change dynamics and they're going to flex business models. So if you're out there waiting for normal, you're looking for the wrong thing. Like I said before, it's about agility. It's about flat and, 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 and high trust, fast communication that'll allow whatever organization to be able to uh, pivot and adapt. And whether that's to an, you know, an external factor like the pandemic or a new innovation that suddenly makes a uh, business a little bit different, uh, you've got to be able to adjust. So in our world, the sports world, I say our competition isn't the uh, Atlanta Hawks, you know, ac across the across town. Our competition is the 80 inch flat screen TV that keep, keeps people at home. And unless I create a, a, an experience so compelling, so rewarding, so hospitable um, that, that people will get off their couch that will, they'll leave their refrigerator, they'll pay for parking to come downtown, they'll pay for a season ticket. Uh, that's a high bar. So just, I use that as an example to say, an innovation like a flat screen TV that now costs only a couple hundred bucks and everybody can afford it. And I've got this amazing sports, immersive sports experience in my living room has suddenly raised the bar for the fan experience that we need to deliver uh, at Mercedes-Benz Stadium every time uh, we, we open up our gates. So uh, there ain't no new normal. Um, and as long as you stay innovative, stay agile, whatever the, the world or the competition sends your way, chances are you'll be able to overcome that and adjust and, 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 and drive success. So you're telling your team and organization, we don't know what the future holds, but we are going to adapt and be ready for it. And with our teamwork, our leadership, our culture, we'll find a way forward through it, right? Yeah. I mean, look at that. So I just left the car business and I used to preach to the team. If you think about the last 150 years, all we've been doing is perfecting the internal combustion engine. Now we're seeing autonomous driving. We're seeing electric driving. We're seeing, we're seeing more change in our industry. And I've said in the next 10 years, we'll see more change than the previous 150. So change is, is part of our future and the ability to adapt and to pivot in an ever changing environment is a, is a capacity, is a business virtue that every organization should strive for. Is trust the most important component of leading through change? It, you know, at, at, at the end, um, Trust is the, is the lowest common denominator. It's the foundation upon which everything is built. Leadership is a contract. I will provide you lead, I will provide you insight, great leadership resources, and you will bring your best self every day, every day and provide all of those inputs. So it's a contract, but a contract at the end, a handshake is, is built on trust. If I don't believe that, that, um, that you're gonna bring it every single day, then we don't have a contract. So at, the, so at the end, I, I agree with your premise. Um, the foundation upon which great organizations are built uh, starts with trust. Steve, we always like to leave people with some takeaways that they can take with them for their teams, their organizations, their families. What are three takeaways that you can share in terms of how we can get better and move forward as a person, family, company, organization, sure. you name it? How can we get better? Sure. So I, I, have, a, I have a set of um, I have a set of leadership beliefs. That, that I talk about all the time that sort of inform how I show up as a leader every single day. Um, I, I shared with you one, so I'll leave you with, again, listen more than you speak. Um, the only way you're learning and growing is when you're listening. If, if you're talking all the time, all you're doing is validating that which you already know. So the ability to close this part 
open up this part, absorb inputs from other people who've got different backgrounds, different insights, different experiences. That's your only way to get smarter. So listen more than you speak. Uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. If I have, if I have uh, 10 minutes to spend and I can spend it on only one thing, invest in culture in creating that amazing operating system that governs your organization. Um, and, and at the end, um, it's all about people. Uh, so take care of people. Uh, leadership is a sacred trust. The care and welfare of, of human beings is what I get out of bed for every single day. It's the most gratifying aspect. And to know I'm in charge of an organization where people can show up, love what they do, drive purpose for themselves every single day. Sure, they're going to earn a living and an income, but that's less important. Income matters, purpose matters more. So drive and find a way to create that purpose-driven environment. That's so good, Steve. What are you excited about as we move forward? Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm excited about the challenge of the day. You know, every day I wake up and think, all right, we, um, uh, today we can get better. I mean, most good, but you know, if you talk about most coaches, it's about what can we do better? And there's always, always something. So um, I, my boss talks about it all the time, Arthur Blank. Uh, one of the things that has driven him in his whole life is there is no finish line. And, and I love that because, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm an athlete, I've run marathons, and, and we all know inherently that you're never done. You can always get a little bit better. There is no finish line. And the minute you start thinking, I'm there, that's the day you start falling back. So I, you know, for me, I, I get out of bed in the morning thinking, what can I do better? And that gets me excited. Steve Cannon, thanks for making us better today. I know that I am, and we appreciate you. Thank you so much. John, thank you. Appreciate it. I also appreciate our viewers for watching. I want to thank our sponsors for making this podcast possible. Join us next month, where our guest will be Brian Solis, a renowned digital anthropologist and futurist. Brian will be talking about the future of digital business and the disruption that's happening and how it impacts you and your business. Hope to see you there. <laughs>